I woke up the next morning naked. Come to find out my boys had pissed all over me. And, like, no just, way. And they thought it was funny. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these are the stories that were laid to me because I didn't know. In college, I was in a band all through college, and that continued another 10 years after I graduated. And so, but I mean, that was a huge part of my life. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? 100%. I did some songs in a movie uh, called The Hornet's Nest that's uh, on Amazon Prime still to this day. It's okay. a uh, documentary on the war in Afghanistan. Because I tried. I mean, I tried to stop, you know. I don't know how many conversations we had about when are you going to stop drinking or you said you would stop drinking. And Matt was a young and impressionable lead singer. And as expected, he was surrounded by alcohol. But before alcohol became a problem, he got married and realized he was really a romantic at heart and wanted a family. He tells us how alcohol drove a wedge between his life and his wife today on Chopping It Up. Mr. Green. What's up, my man? What's up, buddy? I'm glad you came. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you making time to come through. It means a lot. I know you got a I know you got a good story, man. Yeah, you know what it's it's funny. Uh I never thought about it too much until uh you just realized that life goes by so quick. And yeah, I have a decent story. I mean, it's probably one that a lot of people can relate to. Right. Well, and you're also one of the one you're actually the person that told me to lean into this more. So I kind of lean it into the whole prison side of addiction and all that struggle part of my life because of influence from you. So if if I didn't bring you on here, it'd be kind of stupid, wouldn't it? No, I'm, I'm just glad you're doing your thing, dude. Yeah, um, yeah, first, I mean, shit, when we first met, I met you offline to get a tattoo. And, uh, you know, it's funny. You look at you and you're like this big motherfucker with this long beard and, and you know, you're a little wild. And uh, you couldn't have been more kind and comforting to somebody like me who probably would be intimidated by somebody like you, right? That's what's up. And uh, a few years later, you know, we've become good friends and you've tattooed a lot of my body. So That's what's up, yeah, man. man. I I'm appreciate proud of your you, trust. I appreciate your trust, too. You know, that means a lot. So uh, let's start with your childhood, bro. Like, how did you grow up? Like, uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, middle class, lower class, upper class? Yeah, so middle class, pretty much all the way, uh, lived... Uh, I say south of D.C., but grew up in Northern Virginia, in uh, Manassas. And, um, yeah, it was a super easy childhood, man. Uh, had uh, lots of friends. I was good at a lot of shit. I, was, I played sports. I spent most of my childhood playing basketball and soccer and uh, competed at a fairly high level. So, for me, athletics and just a uh, friend group and shit like that uh, all came pretty easy. And... Um, you know, reflecting on a lot of things, and I'm not going to say too much about it because my mom is amazing, but I was super sheltered at the same time, right. you know, um, addiction and uh, really just the world, it being what it really is, right? It's, we're, we're troubled people. Uh, we're all flawed, and uh, I kind of grew up thinking that everybody was beautiful and kindness wins the world, right? And um, I carried that with me till almost 40 years old. And I I just turned 43. So, I mean, I lived most of my life kind of under this false guise of uh, just thinking that that's just how it was. Um, and I think, um, you know, going through some of the issues with alcohol, because that, that was my downfall uh, or my learning experience, right? Mm -hmm. So when did you start drinking, though? What, what age was that? So it's funny, man. I, I tried. I, I probably had my first... It's my first time drinking. I think I had 13 shots of Tangare. I don't know why I remember that, but it was just me and some of my buddies. Uh, my parents had a box of liquor in, in the back of one of the rooms in our basement, and they weren't big drinkers, or I didn't think they were. Um, my dad definitely wasn't, but uh, they had it for parties and stuff like that. So as a curious kid, you see this box of liquor, and my boys were like, we should try this, and uh, got absolutely shit hammered as a 13-year-old or whatever it was, you know. I woke up the next morning naked, not knowing what the fuck had happened. Come to find out my boys had pissed all over me. And like, no just, way. And they thought it was funny. Right. They went hard on and, you the uh, first time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these are the stories that were laid to me because I didn't know. I didn't know shit. And uh, that was a bad enough experience for me, man. I did not drink until my senior year of high school after that. Okay. Uh, I was the kid taking care of people at parties, making sure nothing got too out of hand. Um, yeah, uh, I was, I was a goody goody for, for lack of a better word, to be honest with I you. I can see that. 
I can see that you you trying to take care of the people and holding the girl's hair back while she threw up. Yeah, I can man, see that from that, you. That's definitely cleaning up and, and shit like that. And uh, that was kind of my role, man. I was a happy-go-lucky kid. Like I said, uh, lots of great friends. I enjoyed school. I was good at it. You know, I just, I'm, I've always been a good test taker. So I think I, I would, uh, it was easy for me to memorize shit so I could quickly take a test. I got straight A's through college and high school. Okay, how many years of college did you do? I graduated. I did four years at Radford. Okay. Radford no University. No shit. For what? I got my degree in media studies and advertising. I did not know that. And it is nothing like it is now because it's all social media now. So right. I was I'm learning stuff that was obsolete is obsolete now right. to some degree. Maybe the principles exist to some in some. It's kind of like shorthand was for uh, uh, secretaries back in the day. Something Remember what like shorthand that. was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some queer, weird names and stuff they wrote that meant words. Yeah, and man. So nobody does that anymore. Yeah, no. I mean, uh, so college was never the type of thing that was. It was almost taken for granted. It was I was going to go to college, and I was lucky enough for my parents to to pay for that. Right. Um, and uh, I I loved again. It was an extension of my really college is just an extension of your youth. It's an it's a at the end of the day, in my opinion, it's just it gives you more years to be immature. Right. And 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 you learn things, and you and you develop a sense of self, and and some. In ways that maybe you wouldn't have th- by not having that experience, but I think we see a lot of immaturity, and I'm I'm at fault for it, um, because people aren't growing up as fast. They're 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 just extending their childhood right. and, par- and partying right. for the most part. Or at least Is that it, was my experience. So you were partying too, or did you not party through college? Yeah, too? no. So f- for sure in college, definitely uh, took to drinking. Okay. Um, wasn't really a big smoker. So too much. If you had to say drug of choice, what would your drug of choice be? Yeah. So alcohol, and and I mean, I make no bones about it. I don't have a problem saying it. I'm an alcoholic. Right. right. Um. Some people don't like saying that. Some people feel like they're defining themselves or putting themselves in a box. But it's my reality. It's the truth. I, I don't. I can't handle myself around it. I liked it way too much. Right. Um. And uh, in college, I actually, you know, my sports career had ended at that point, and. Uh, met a different group of friends, and in addition to a lot of my friends that came from high school, but um, uh, met some musicians. So I discovered music, and that I was a singer and a songwriter. Right on. And uh, you know, so I, you were in a band too, right? Yeah. So definitely started uh, in college. I was in a band all through college, and that continued another ten years after I graduated. And so that's a whole other story. But I mean, that was a huge part of my life. Um, well, I mean, being part of a band, there's got to be partying and, well, and drugs exi- and drinking and girls and I exactly mean, sex, drugs and rock and roll, right? Hundred percent. And I will say this though, I was so um, it it mattered to me so much how I performed, how I sang, especially that in the early years, I had like a two or three drink minimum. Okay. I, I would only have a few beers on stage or what have you. It was, and then. As time went on and I became better and we became better and we became bigger, did more shows, uh, had more success, you know, just like anything else, you get more comfortable with it. And so the dr- drinking it became muscle memory was was definitely, you know, towards the end. I remember one show where I I basically forgot all the words and, and fell, fell on my ass on stage and and all the guys were pissed and we all partied. But they, you know, I'm the I'm the lead, I'm the front guy, right? Um, I have a responsibility to put on a good show and uh, at least remember the fucking words to the tunes. And uh, that, in in retrospect, that was kind of a interesting moment um, because at that point I realized that even at that point, and I don't know, I was probably 25, 26, that uh, I didn't have a handle on, on drinking. And um, for me, it was a, mostly beer. To be honest with you, I wasn't a big liquor guy. How much beer was you drinking a day? So at towards the end, it's my my alcohol experience is 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 I think it's different. I think it's kind of weird, but um, dude, I, I don't know. Like in college, it was an every but it was an everyday thing. So I was getting drunk every day. So maybe it was six or seven beers some days, and then some days it's probably a case. You know what I right, mean? But you woke up and drank first thing in the morning. Not until many years later. Okay. Right. So. So th- all through during college and, and through my experience being in a band, you definitely overindulged in drinking. Um, and I think people realized it, I think. But it, it was because I was successful in a lot of other arenas and just in life in general at that point, uh, I maintained. 
And it wasn't anything that I even questioned, to be honest. I, th- I think maybe in the back of my mind it touched. I was like, maybe I'm drinking too much, but everybody else around me was too. Right. And I remember, even to- I remember having a conversation with my drummer like early on saying, dude, I-, I think I drink too much and this and that. He's like, no, nah, dude, we all, this is, this is what we do. This is the norm. And this is the norm. And uh, so I definitely normalized it um, in my mind. And again, being naive to addiction, not really growing up with a lot of people doing drugs or alcohol, at least to the extent. Uh, Sorry, guys, that's the mailman in the background. I know y'all can hear that. It's very annoying. I apologize. Continue. It's all good, dude. Um, I, f- I forgot. I totally uh, fucked your thought I, up. I didn't lost I? my train of thought, and that <laughs> happens. That happens. So when you're in this band, too, though, I know you were married. How long did... Did the band go, like, married in the band or married after the band? Um, towards the end of the band, so... So, but she knew you during the band years? Yes, uh, towards, okay. towards the end. And, and this was when we were actually really successful. So I was going out to Los Angeles all the time to, to record. What was the band's name? We were uh, Politics. Okay, and, and they can still be found on YouTube and stuff, yeah. too, right? Uh, with a C-K-S, so P-O-L-I-T-I-C-K-S. Okay, okay. So there's some stuff out there. Um, and we, like I said, we, had, we enjoyed some pretty decent success where... It sounds stupid and almost like it's not true, but I mean, we were super close to signing a, a, a deal with Mercury Records at the time, like a, a million dollar deal, right? Development deal. Um, and then the housing market crashed. So that in 2008 so, okay. was kind of when things, that was towards the end of being in a band band. Um, but I continued writing music and as like a solo performer with my guitar player, we were kind of the, the two leaders and songwriters, the I guess the engine that kind of drove right on drove the joint. Um, I, I continued to do things, so I had opportunities. I did some songs in a movie uh, called The Hornet's Nest that's uh, on Amazon Prime still to this day. It's okay. a uh, documentary on the war in Afghanistan. So I remember being flown out to L.A. and previewing what this movie was about, so I could get inspired to write music for it. Right on, that's what's up. Um, and yeah, dude, it was dope. Um, and then you say you like played on carriers and stuff for the Marines or something. Yeah, uh, because of that film, we we uh, got to perform at some pretty big shows for Gold Star families. Um, in Gold the military. Star family is they are families who lost their uh, children and and war. Oh, and, okay. And, and, okay. And, and I, if I'm mistaken on that, then I, right, I, I could be wrong. But regardless, the Gold Star family is something to do with the military. Yeah, and uh, we performed on some aircraft carriers. We got to do some really neat shit. Um, and it was, I thought, you know, I thought music would, I thought it would always be in my life, but, um, it's funny you mentioned getting married. Uh, I always wanted to be a family man. I always wanted to settle down, have kids and all that. So for me, that took precedence over my art because okay. that's just what I, that's just what I always wanted, man. I'm a, I'm a sensitive romantic, to be honest with you, to be honest, there's no other way to describe mm-hmm. how I am with that shit. And, uh, so for, for me, um, when music, when that started to f- fizzle out a little bit, that's what I wanted to do. And, and mind you, as an adult after college, I still worked jobs, per- like p- career type jobs where I was balancing uh, the music and the jobs. Now, I didn't last at all of those jobs, mm-hmm. but um, I, I tried to balance it as best I could. Um, still drinking? Still drinking. And so if you, we fast forward a little bit to, I don't know. Late 2000, like early 2010s, like I want to say, um, I started working in for sales companies, right? And so a lot of the environment was after work, you went to happy hours almost mm-hmm. every single day, right? Even even when we'd celebrate big wins in the office, you'd have a few pops, you'd have a beer or two. It wasn't unheard of. It was what it just kind of was. It's a societal norm, bro. Yeah, it, it was. Is. And so at that point, when I could start getting away with having some drinks at work, that's really when my alcoholism took a turn for the worse. Okay. Because it was something that I could get away with. Um, and after 10 years of drinking almost every day, you know, my body had developed a physical dependency. Um, <laughs> and I remember having withdrawals. In my mind, though, it was just anxiety. It was, I, 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 was I, I don't want to go to work. I'm nervous. Uh, you know what I mean? And you know, many years later, I was diagnosed with uh, bipolar. So I've dealt with anxiety, depression, those types of things like a lot of people do. Um, 
But I think given my sensitive personality, to be honest, uh, it affected me pretty rough. And so the drinking was a way to deter some of that anxiety. Um, and it wasn't necessarily social. I love people, always have. I've always been uh, it's pretty easy going mm-hmm. fellow when it comes to just chit-chatting and, and bullshitting with folks. Right, going out with people and things yeah, like that. Yeah. I feel like you're easy going. But um, it was just this, the internal struggle that I felt um, and, and the nervous energy that I developed later in life. And <clears throat> it's funny because when I think about it as a child, I had some of those tendencies, but doing athletics my whole life, I worked those things out of my system because I was always on the go. I was always playing sports. You know what I mean? Okay. I, uh, but as an adult, when I stopped some of those things and wasn't as healthy and wasn't treating my body right, um, those th- that anxiety and some of that depression really kind of reared its ugly head. Um, and that's and alcohol is a depressant, right? So over time, I'm physically becoming dependent, um, and 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 mentally at, at that point because it was a break. It was a break from me worrying. I, I was a worry wart. You know what I mean? I I was I was always thinking the worst, right? catastrophizing as they say right and we use to numb the pain regardless of what it is yeah whatever the case may be right so um and i'll say this too i was a good drunk i was a fun drunk uh i didn't start any shit i wasn't an angry guy so i didn't yeah i definitely don't see that yeah no so i was a good time i I was a good time and and i wasn't like makes it easier too though right because if there were consequences like car crashes or fights or or Right, none of that, Hospitalizations and things yep. like that. You you learn a little bit faster because you get burnt. Yeah, no, I was lucky. I was lucky in that regard, right? And in hindsight, maybe some of those things happening would have deterred me, and I would have learned some lessons early sure. on. But, I, you know, I feel blessed in a lot of things that uh, I was good at, I guess, for lack of a better word. So, I mean, I got away with it. I got away with it for a long time. And again, my naivety into addiction... I, I, I knew I drank too much, but I didn't think I had a problem and I didn't think that it would affect me because it just hadn't really right. um, to, for the most part, um, you know, until. So you can't really remember big consequences of drinking. I mean, you fell down on stage. Like, like one you, time, right? And that's it. it and, you can't and, really. And, and, and it was embarrassing. And I, I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But it was still, it was the rock and roll thing, right? Right. And it just, it was what it was. Um, the first consequence. Uh, if I think back would be at that job I was that, I, that I'm talking about where it was kind of in the, in the, in the workplace, it was, you could have beers for the, a little bit. And people did that towards the end of that five years where I was at that company. I was, I had started drinking in my car during the work day. So it was, you know, I'm going to go to the bathroom, but really what I'm doing is I'm running down the fucking stairs as fast as I can, getting in my car, cracking a beer, chugging it, coming back to my desk. Did that four or five times a day, right? And uh, then, of course, at home, I, I would continue. But um, right, towards so the, you come back into work and you like just feel that buzz kind of slowly come you on. You feel good, you I've know. I've done I, that at lunchtime. I've left at lunchtime on a job, drank a beer, come back and been like, whoa. Yeah, man. So and, you just kind of had that little whoa. And I'd been there for a while at that point. So I felt, you know, I had my job under control. You know, everybody was used to me just being kind of a silly fucking guy in the office still anyways. still accomplishing tasks. Yeah. Now, at my best level, absolutely not. Right. Not at all. Right. And, and towards the end, though, I uh, I was taking it too far, man. And I uh, it was the last day of the month, right? And so in most sales gigs, the, the last day of the month, everybody stays late and is, is trying to pull in those last deals and, 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 and whatever. And then it starts all over again the next month. And it's just the same bullshit. And it's never good enough because when you have a quota, it just increases. And and whatever that's just the reality of never show of, them what you can do because then they expect it of you yeah maybe a little bit there might have been a little bit of that and as soon as you meet that 2000 quota now they want you to hit 25 you can't go below 2000 after the first time you do that good though right yeah that's the that is the uh i think the insanity of of some of these jobs especially when you're younger you've got these people um motivating you by thinking the only way you can do better is you work longer, how longer, faster, more, uh, mm-hmm. you know, with more intensity, you get to a point where you're fucking burnt out. Make um, me more money. Yeah. And uh, that's some, what it boils down to. It's make me more money. A hundred percent. And some people are cut out for that. And so, and you know, I, I don't know that that just wasn't, I've always been a work smarter, not harder kind of guy. Now I think that, 
maybe I should have worked harder at times, right? Mm-hmm. But I, that's always been my attitude to some degree is that I want to I wanted a work life balance, you know. Well, um, yeah, I mean, and it's li- in, a, in a sales capacity that's difficult. You work to live, you don't live to work. I've always said that too. These people that are out working 50, 60 hours a week, like where's your life? Yeah. And a lot of them, uh, a lot of people don't have, have one or, 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 or they be, they identify their, their sense of self-success is defined through that nine to five. Now there's also different stories because let's just say, for example, it's a father of five and he's got to take care of all, you know, 100%. totally like his life is those kids. That's all 100%. he cares about. He'll work 75 hours a week and cut his fucking fingers off for him. Yeah. And I respect that. 100%. And that's. But when you're working 60 hours a week and you're barely able to keep the electric on, like, I just feel like that's not a fun life, is it? No. And that's the, but that's the reality of this society we live in where if you're not fucking grinding, you're falling behind. And I I, I have a little bit of a, I don't want to say, I, yeah, I, I think that sucks. I wish that. In America, you could work hard and and, and pay your. I, I wish it was easier to pay the bills and have a few things that you'd like, um, as opposed to going through your entire life and grinding your ass off and and getting by by the skin of your teeth. You know, at the end of the day, we get old and we die. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's never been my inclination to want to just work my life away. Yeah, and keep grinding, keep grinding, keep grinding. Um. Yeah, but on the on the other hand, there are, there are t- there are many times in my life where I probably should have pushed myself more. Yeah, uh, yeah, I and, I've, and I've learned that, that. And, I, and I'm I'm learning. I'm still learning that. Yeah, well, uh, you grow wiser as you grow older. You said you're how old? Forty. Forty three, dude. Forty three. Well, I'll be forty eight this year. Yeah. And I feel a little wiser every year. I feel like I know a little bit more. I've experienced a little bit more. Um, yeah. But these things right here are making me wiser every day. Every time I do one of these, I learn something from y'all, and I love that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's one of the coolest things. Um, but no, so I, what I was saying, though, is toward, towards the very end of my job, it was the last day of the month where everybody's supposed to be working their ass off. And I got hammered. I was going out to my car like every hour. <laughs> it's like five o'clock in the evening. And we probably the beer didn't even have a chance to wear off before you were getting another one. So you were literally drinking. I was fucked up. There's a difference between one beer every two hours yeah. and one beer every hour. I was I was fucked up at that point. Uh, and I, uh, at like, I don't know, we, you work till like seven or eight. Sometimes you stay till midnight to pull in that mm-hmm. deal. Right. Um, but it was like five o'clock in the evening and there's a knock on my car window. I'm fucking passed out in my car in no the, way. in the uh, parking garage. Cause you went down for a beer. Cause I, went, I had been drinking beer. I had been taking, you know, 15 bathroom breaks and chugging beers. And I must have had one, and I don't know how long I was asleep what, for. Did uh, you keep your beer cold in the in the car? Nah, dude. No, it was warm. Yeah. Just, See, I've heard that before. Now I had I've had an ex girlfriend that used to go out from college, and she would talk about drinking hot beer in the middle of summertime. And I always thought that was crazy. It but didn't I, matter. It doesn't matter if it's warm or cold or or, or flat. Doesn't matter. Didn't matter, dude. I, I was the kind of guy at a certain point where, at parties or even at this is disgusting. I, I remember being at bars, and if there was fucking, if somebody left their drink fucking full, I'd be the guy. <laughs> when no one's looking, I'll, I'll drink it. Snatched it up. Yeah, like not when they're there. I wouldn't steal the drink, but if somebody, if there was a group of people that I knew or I didn't think were disgusting, but it was still disgusting for on my part, I would, I would drink fucking floaters, dude. I just didn't care. Hmm. I didn't have to pay for it. I didn't. Right. I was cheap. I was a cheap drunk. Right. On top of it. But yeah, it didn't matter if it was warm or cold. And in my car, I kept them in a backpack. And uh, and it, it became work. But uh, yeah, so I'm 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 drunk. And it, somebody knocks on my door, on my window. And it's like, Matthew, what are you doing, dude? And um, I was disheveled. And I walked back into my to my job. I went into HR and I said, I resign. I resigned. And in hindsight, I don't know if I... There would have been there. Yes, there would have been alternate ways to handle that. I could have probably said, "I have a problem. I need help," mm-hmm. and I probably would have been granted that that type of opportunity. Depending on the company, that sounds um, like we'll help you, but and um, pay you for it. Yeah, in hindsight, I wish I would have had the foresight and the knowledge. Mm-hmm. Again, at this point, I'm still just I don't know shit about addiction other than I know I drink too much. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't until a lot later when I went to rehab that uh, I, I learned a lot. Uh, about not just about alcohol, but other drugs and other types of people. Again, I was really sheltered. Um, 
And right, so, so you never had experiences with addiction. Like, I didn't see the underbelly of life, if you will. Right, um, understood. I was it, you know, and that was just what it was. Um, and so how long have you been clean at this point? So a little over three years. And then how did you get clean? You said you went to a rehab? Yeah, so, you know, fast forward, I'm married and, and uh, bouncing from job to job because I was having trouble keeping job. I was an alcoholic. Um, and towards the end of my alcohol use, it was wake up in the morning at six o'clock and every morning you have diarrhea, you have the sweats, you're getting sick to your stomach. Again, I'm blaming this all on anxiety and depression and, uh, probably my ability to hold a job, inability rather. And so for me, I think I had, I had no confidence too, but at the end of the day, they, these are all withdrawals. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd have a beer at six, six thirty in the morning in the shower. And then before I left the house, I had to have another one just to kind of get the engine going, just to kind of get clear the cobwebs and just, you know, hair the dog, feel better, feel not sick. Mm -hmm. And then on the way to work, um, I always had a commute. So whether it was, whether you're going in Northern Virginia, whether you're going 10 miles or it, everything takes an hour, whatever. <laughs> I'm having a beer or two in the car on the way. And, you know, I'm putting them in uh, soda cans to conceal them. So, but every single day I'm drinking in the car, which is horrible and dangerous and inexcusable to some degree. Cause I, at the end of the day, I could be harming other people. Uh, but when you're in the midst of it, you don't think of those things. Now, you don't even care. Now what I'll say though, is towards the end, I was probably drinking about 12 beers a day, which isn't that crazy, but I was also hiding it from my wife. And that was the best I could do. If I would could if I could have drank more, I would have. But my goal was to not feel shitty, and to keep this buzz going all day long. To where if I did have to drive, I wasn't shit faced. Um, you know, in the evenings when I got home, I'm, I'm sure I probably I probably went to bed pretty hammered. But throughout the day, from six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning to ten o'clock at night, I am spreading out the alcohol all throughout the day in a way where I'm hiding it and it's just work. It sucks. And I doubt toward that was the last few years of my drinking. That was my, that's what I did. I drank. So you got to the chaos stage. It's just, it's like, uh, with drugs for me, with the oxys and all that shit, it was the chase. It was yeah. that constant chase of always looking, feeling sick, looking, trying to find some drugs, feeling good for three days. For you, it's different because you could find the alcohol at any corner. Oh, yeah. But you have to hide it from everyone throughout oh, yeah. the day. Oh, yeah. And and you start to feel, you know, you go to different seven. I would go to different 7-Elevens. I would mm. go to different convenience stores throughout the week. Trying so, to save face. Trying to save face, knowing that those people knew that I was buying alcohol there multiple times a week at 6, 7 in the morning. Right. I mean, I'm, not, you know, they know what you I'm- You can only skip so many stores when you're going five times a day. Yeah. And, uh, but- Feeling feeling good was meant way more to me than I had no pride at that point. I, I, you know, I wanted to save face, but I wasn't. And, and again, I was lying to my wife because she knew. I mean, she knew I was a drinker, um, and it was a problem. I mean, that that's the reason why our marriage. You're kind of oblivious, though, right? You're kind of oblivious at this stage in addiction. When you're at that point, you know, but you're oblivious to what people see. I thought that. You know, I was naive thinking that a woman could stay in love with me forever because she had loved me at one point. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I, in hindsight, I can see why absolutely somebody could fall out of love with someone. I was, I describe myself as like 50% of a person. Okay. I operated just enough to get by and be responsible enough and to, to be a good guy. And, um, you know, to maintain just a bit of my, you know, a, a, a upbeat personality. But when you're operating on 50%, you're not doing yourself any favors. You're not doing your employee any favors. Um, you're not living up to your potential. And at the end of the day, you're dis, you know, you're disappointing the people that you love most. Um, and it was, it was, it was her. And um, it's the biggest regret of my life. And, you know, yeah. And I still have, issues with it i haven't come to complete right like, acceptance Re recently of, divorced her right how, how long since the divorce has been final so we were separated for 
over three years. And for various reasons, the divorce just took a little bit of time. So technically I didn't get divorced until, I don't know, six months ago, something like that. Right. And, uh, you know, it was so she could change her name back and get on with her life. And um, we remain super friendly and not even amicable. I mean, I would drop, if she called right now, I would drop this podcast and I would go, I would would do what I can for this person because I've never loved anybody that much in my life. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, man, but when you're 50% of yourself at the end of the day, you're, you're really not shit. Um, and, uh, I got away. I thought I was getting away with it. And I thought it, my marriage, I I think I thought too, that I would eventually outgrow this shit, that I would be able to find a way to stop because I tried. I mean, I tried to stop, you know, I don't know how many conversations we had about, you know, when are you going to stop drinking? Or you said you would stop drinking. And so what, what did you do to try to stop? What what, what was the actions you took? It didn't work. Obviously it didn't work. Yeah, no. So at one point, and again, this shows, this just speaks to my, just not being with it. But at one point I went to detox. I went to the hospital and I went to three days of an alcohol detox because, you know, now I had learned that uh, alcohol withdrawal is one of the most dangerous there yeah, you is. you can die from it. You know, benzos and, and alcohol can be they can kill you. some of the danger, uh, more dangerous ones in, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Um, seizures. Yeah. Seizures are super common. Now- I was super lucky that I didn't have any of those issues, but I went to a detox facility at the hospital for three days and I convinced myself that I was the least, I didn't need to be like compared to everybody else. I was like the best, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, and some of that's not being humble enough to be realistic about my situation. And some of it was, yeah, there were some pretty fucked up people there on some pretty hard drugs, you know, stuff that I didn't know about. I didn't know about opiates. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about, um, benzos and, and, I just didn't. It wasn't in my circle. And if it was, I was naive to it. I didn't see it. Um, The shitty thing about going to detox was I thought that was the last thing you did. I thought that was the, this is how you stop drinking is you you do a detox and you're you're fine. Mm -hmm. I remember people in the rehab talking about going bed to bed. So after they would get out of detox, they'd need to go to a rehab facility. And even while I'm there and pseudo learning about addiction and I really didn't learn shit because the, the, the moral of the story is, is I went to detox thinking that was the end all be all I was cured and the people who had to go bed to bed I was like why are they doing that that's crazy go back home to their families start mm-hmm. their lives again you know I don't and there's a piece of me that thinks I was failed while I was there because I didn't learn anything other than hey I'm 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 not having withdrawals anymore so it's safe for me to stop you know what i mean i was i was safe so i stopped drinking for six months and then i got comfortable and then i picked right back up i picked right back up where i left off it did work for six months relationship with the wife got better a little bit better um about the time you started rebuilding that you celebrated and destroyed it again yeah it's funny i i remember going i went to the i didn't have a job at the time so i went to the beach with her parents and she couldn't go I thought that was a good idea, which is just selfish. Drunk, and, uh, drunk, drunk at the beach? Or? Well, no. So I went there and and uh, I was determined. I'm going to go to the, and to me, you know, I grew up too in, in a family where beers, people partied. Like, so it was, I, I described my childhood as, and a lot of family function as a kind of a Jimmy Buffett attitude, if you will. So not a bunch of derelicts like fighting and doing crazy shit, but it was just this upbeat kind of party atmosphere and so that was normal to me um but yeah no i was at the beach and for a few days i was cool and i was i was like i'm at the fucking beach i need a corona and it took one and then i'm hiding it from everybody again and i'm drinking all day long and getting and then and then to getting into the liquor cabinet and when no one's looking just you know take a shot of vodka because i knew it wouldn't smell on my breath like some of the other liquors um so i was right back to where i was dude and um yeah, she was super disappointed. Um, I think, I think for a while I lied to myself and to her, thinking that my drinking was normal, that I had gotten to a place where I could have a few drinks on the weekends, this mm-hmm. and that. It wasn't, dude. My my walk-in closet where all my clothes were, fucking half of my suit jackets or what have you, or my clothes had empty beer cans stuffed like 
in the po- inside pockets so they weren't you know what I mean I would I would hide beer cans all over the place and then I'd do like a massive cleanup when forget, no one was around forget all about them for a minute and then come yeah. in and just and then a, these? where's these where's these at I yeah. left some in the closet I left some in the bathroom oh oh here's a half a 40 from a month ago I'm gonna chug it <laughs> you know what I mean? right it's un- under the clothes pile that I thought I was hiding things from so you know you get sloppy you get sloppy with that stuff and I was sloppy and you get tired of the chaos right like, don't you it get was, tired of the... It had got, I had gotten to a point where when I decided to go to re- rehab, I knew that... I want to say I did it for myself because I had a moment. I had, I had this moment. Me and my wife had just bought a new house. And it was like the fresh start I was hoping for, right? And the excitement of being first-time homeowners. And this was going to kind of change something in my brain to where I would be more responsible. Okay. Um, and it didn't. And I had a, and I had a moment... Um, where, and so I, and I, I, so I went to rehab right after Christmas in 2000, 2001. I can't remember. It's been three years. So I guess 2001, uh, the, pa- the, pan- the pandemic had just Two, hit 21. Yes. 2021. So, right. So we had had the pandemic for like six months or so. Okay. Um, and I remember being unemployed and, um, I had like two beers in the fridge and they were hurricanes, mind you. They were the 16 ounce hurricanes. They were, you know, I convinced myself those were delicious. They were just cheap and they had more alcohol in them. Right. And they were bigger. And I had like two left and I had one in my hand. So I was finishing a beer. I had two in the fridge and I got nervous. Mind you, there's a fucking convenience store right across the street, a a block across the street. And I remember getting nervous about it. And so, and when I, when I get anxious, when I get, when I would get these internal feelings of stress or anxiety, uh, yeah, it was crack a beer that goes away. And so I remember drinking my, my, finishing my beer, going into the fridge. I had two left, cracking that beer, drinking it, knowing later on in the day I was going to go get more. Of course, I was going to go get more. It's probably in the afternoon. And uh, I was, I was, I had, you know, I was probably a two or three sips into that second to last beer. And then I'm thinking, I, I got nervous. I'm like, oh, I only got one in the fridge. Meanwhile, I have a full one in my hand. Um, and I remember having to go to the store and I had to drive across the street with, I chugged the second to last one. I had one left and then my panics were really starting to set in. Like, I like, this is my last beer. And again, I, there's a fucking store right there. So I get in the car, I got my, I got my beer with me and yeah, it was like, it was total panic to get that next six pack. When I had, when I, when I was drinking, when I was currently drinking, so it wasn't, there was no break, but just to get in the car, the anxiety of only having one beer left while I take this two minute trip to the car, that was my, that was my moment where I said, this is too hard. This is crazy. That was your breaking point. That was my breaking point is when I had a panic attack because I only had two beers left and I had to go two minutes across the street to get more. That's a fear though, man. That fear is so strong. Oh, it, it that was... fear is the strongest thing that keeps us going back to the addiction. It's whether you're scared of not being drunk, you're scared of not being high, you're scared of being sick, whatever. That's what makes you go back, man. It's it's the fear of not feeling that way. Uh, yeah, man. And so after and after like four or five years of every day j- waking up drinking until I went to bed, and you know, and you'll hear this a lot too. You know, there are times there are times where I'd wake up in the middle of the night and had the sweats, go to the fridge and chug some wine or chug a beer, whatever, and, and, and go back to bed. Um, but yeah, I had, I had a moment. And um, at that point in my life, I had some friends who had some issues with some other substances. And one of my buddies was getting help. And I remember talking to him. And, um, at the, and look, everybody knew at a certain point I was, I was a drunk. Or I, was a, I don't want to even say drunk because I, I pseudo got away with it. But People knew that Matt Green was a drinker. You know what I mean. So it wasn't it wasn't a shock to anybody when I I think when I brought up yeah I've got a problem or this and that. But I remember talking to a buddy who had gotten some help for some other stuff, and I think at that point I realized well it, it empowered me to know that hey maybe I saw a guy that I never thought would have a problem in the world called him the Golden Boy uh, to this day one of my best friends but he had gotten some help for some stuff and uh, it. it I said, wow, okay, like you're not a loser. You're not a piece of shit if you go get help or if you 
go to rehab because to me in my mind i was like that's the end all be all that's that's crazy like only shitty people who have no control go to these places um and again that's just me not knowing enough and 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 being kind of a dick really it's being arrogant yes humility comes along with with uh sobriety arrogance is the perfect word arrogance is is the king of being fucked up because you think you know everything nobody can tell you shit and you just keep doing it sure and um, sure so talking to him really inspired me to say, I, I think, I think at, at that point, even bringing it up, I was nervous for my life at that point. I was nervous for my relationship. Uh, mind you, because I'm in this fucking state, I really didn't think that my marriage was in any real trouble. I, I didn't think at any point that my, my, my life, my wife would want to leave me or any of those things. I thought we got married in the church and I took all these Catholic classes to do, do all these things and. You know, till death do us part. Till I, I, I thought that. So she's not really like on you about going to rehab. You're on it for yourself. You see this guy get help, and now you're headed that direction. But it's no co coercal from your wife. I knew that she needed things to change because I knew that she was unhappy. But you didn't think your marriage was in danger. Like I didn't that. think my da- my marriage was in danger. Okay. I thought I thought walking into rehab i thought one if i was successful and, and came back home 30 days later learning things and really doing the work uh that i would be welcomed back with open arms right like you hadn't done that much damage but at that point she was no longer in love with me right i didn't see that to me we were still best friends right you know but really at the end of the day i'm just sitting half so drunk obviously y'all didn't fight there wasn't like arguments and cussing at each other and fighting and you know, where you been or why are you drinking? It wasn't like this nagging. No, not really. She and just kind of settled in and accepted it without bitching at you. I think, yeah, I think she was defeated. And at a certain that's point, a good, I think it was. Word. And, and at a certain point, too, I mean, it's not like uh, she was anti-drinking. I mean, again, we both kind of come from fun families. And and I, what what hurts me a little, uh, what hurts me a lot is I think at a certain point, she was like, if you can't beat them, join them. And she's and she started drinking more than she needed to, um, just to deal with it. J- yeah, and and because it was always around, and it's like you know, you know she that was a way of commiserating and maybe yeah. having something in common. I don't know, maybe. But I take full responsibility for the fact that I get. You know what? I just I get it. Right. I get it. I get. Yeah, I I, I get it. And uh, but so, again, man. So you go, I, so you go to rehab. I go to rehab. And this is 2001, um, yeah, right man. after the pandemic. After talking to my buddy, I remember being nervous as fuck. And I got on my telephone and I started researching places near me. And I came across this spot called Recovery Unplugged. And what was, and it was one of the first places I saw. Okay. But it was dope about it. It's, it's, a music, it's, it's music based to some degree. So they, they do a lot of music therapy. They, you know, that's kind of the spin that they have on their rehab facility. And so, so I have an ex girlfriend that uh, studied music therapy at Shenandoah College. Okay, that's a thing now. It's like a major in college, and I can understand where you'd like that because you and me are both the same when it comes to music. It's very healing for us. Well, yeah, and I knew I could bring my guitar, and they had instruments right. there and shit right. like that. Plus, you was already in a band and shit. Right? Yeah, so I thought, you know what? And and what's funny, man, is in retrospect, if I wouldn't have come across that particular rehab, if it wasn't. Like a God intervening, or just to the timing of things, I don't know if I would have said. I don't know if I would have been man enough to say, "Yeah, I'm. Gonna, I want to go to this shitty place." I, I think there was. I was super lucky to have found this place at a moment when I was panicked, looking for a solution. Just talked to my buddy, and it just came together for me. And I said, "I'm going to make this call." And a week later, right after Christmas, um, right after the New Year, it was uh, January fourth. That's that's when I stopped drinking. Um, yeah, I went to this place. It was an hour from my house, maybe not even, and um, walked in super green, um, not knowing shit about rehab, not knowing what what I was going to be experiencing and um, any of that. So I went in super blind. But I'll tell you what, there, I participated. I threw myself into it. I was I wanted to fix this. You wanted something different. I wanted to fix this because it, I mean, it was hell. It was hell for four or five years towards the end. It was hell. Like every day, that's all I thought about. All I thought about was maintaining some buzz. And, you know, I ruined, I ruined a lot of things because of it. Um, so I had had enough. Um, funny thing too, is 
I'm the kind of guy who, even though I probably come across as a, a, a somewhat of a rule follower, maybe I don't know, maybe I don't, know, but I, I, I always am skeptical. And and when I don't like the smartest person in the room, I think going back to some humility, some arrogance, I wanted to be the smartest person in the room, you know. And so going into rehab, um, I tried to let go of some of that, right? I tried to humble myself a little bit. And in most of these places, a lot of the, uh, what you learn is a lot of it's AA based, right? A lot of the the base for some of these things. And, and I remember, um, I've always been somewhat spiritual, but I've gone through periods in life where I loved to learn. I've loved, always loved to learn about religion. I've loved to learn about history and different things. Um, so as a thinker, you know, I would probably describe myself a lot of times in my life as somebody who was pretty agnostic, to who who knew I didn't know, but wanted to know more. Um, maybe even kind of on the cusp of atheist to some degree, where, you know, and what that that was the pseudo scholar in my mind, like where I wanted to be smart because I knew okay. a lot of shit. So with that in your head, you, you're taking this in, you're listening, you're kind of studying. So kind of. So I remember doing every day we'd have multiple AA type meetings, but in the house where I stayed, there's probably like 12 guys in a house in the, at this facility. And then there was another house that had X amount of people there, but we'd always have a meeting in the evenings with the guy who kind of ran the house. And, you know, some of it's faith-based and a lot of people who get into AA, the easiest thing to do is when they get to that step. And I'm, and, and, and I'll say this, I'm not, I don't necessarily follow the steps. It wasn't something that I like incorporated into my life. I never got a sponsor. And I'm not saying that those, you know, whatever works for you works for you. It's, right. it's, it's, I'm the opinion of that. But I think that these places, I think a lot of people do need rules. And I think A is a great way to quit drinking. I really do. But like a lot of people, you get to that God part where you have to accept God in your life or, or know that there's, I did, I want, I didn't want to buy all in because again, I, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of do it on my own. So even though I had submitted to the fact that I needed help, that I was going to rehab, there's still a piece of me because I'm me for 40, for 40 fucking years where I wanted to, I wanted to know best. And so I, you know, I, I would, I got caught up. It's, it's, it's such a cliche getting caught up on that God piece or that higher power. Right. Um, and it was, it's really just an excuse to not want to do the work. Right, so what's that? So did this, that stop you from rehab? Or? So this is the point that, that I was going to make. So my bad, but right. It's only been four minutes, <laughs> <laughs> but go but ahead. So the, I, the, and the, I understand that completely because the whole spirituality thing was always weird to me. And I'm not, you know me, I'm not a big spiritual person, you know? And then one time somebody explained it, it's like, you can believe in that doorknob if you want. And I just right, thought man. that was one of the dumbest things to right. say that, like you believe in a doorknob. I get it. You're talking about having faith in pretty much anything, but uh, and what it really is, is is letting go of your sense of self to some degree, knowing that it's just that you're not the reason why everything in this world happens. That there's other things out there. There's other forces. There's other energy. There's other people that are going to affect your life. Right? It's not you're not the end all be all. Right? It's accepting the fact that there are other there are more important things in life than just what goes through my head. Okay. But the guy who led the group. Um, you know, I thought everybody was kind of religious and buying into this thing. And he had said, and he was sober for 33 some years. And he said, he had said, well, I'm agnostic. And he explained that, you know, he, he, he just didn't know, but he didn't allow that piece. He didn't get hung up on that step because he felt that way. Now, it's not like it was this grandiose moment, but it was like the first time that, and, and you, you had mentioned like, Oh, you can believe in the doorknob as your higher power, right? And I didn't buy in any of that. I think it's a little silly, but whatever gets whatever gets the job done gets the job done at the end of the day. Um, but to me, that was somebody who was a, a thinker, a thoughtful person, and they didn't let their uh, lack of belief or knowledge deter them from believing in the bigger picture of what AA could provide. Okay. And so that was a huge moment for me. And that was probably in the first week. And then I just... I, I really just went all in, man. you to accept it more once you could get over that uh, speed yeah, bump. Yeah, because I saw some guy who had 33 years sober, and and that he didn't let that deter him. You know what I mean? And uh, I don't know why that was a big deal to me. Because uh, he knew it. He knew it was a big deal to a lot of people, and that's why he broke it down for people like you right. that could understand it better. Yeah, no. And, and it changed uh, your life. It did. It did. And the, and the irony in all of this, 
as after that point, um, I started letting more traditional religion like enter my life. So I don't, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm a, I'm like the most pious cat or like somebody who's extremely religious, but I would be remiss to say that God doesn't play a role in my life now. Mm -hmm. And without that moment of that door being opened, I, I swear, I don't think that I would feel that way. Um, and I think it's cool. Absolutely. It's interesting. Um, and, uh, because that's definitely a place that a lot of people get hung up. Yeah. Personally, on the same thing for me, I got hung up on that spot too. Uh, it's an I easy like excuse. That, I don't like that setting. Yeah. I've shot away from that setting for years. Yeah, it's hot in here, huh? <laughs> turn this bitch down right here. Oh, wow. Look, lights are brighter. <laughs> <laughs> Is it that hot? I could uh, take this sweatshirt off, but. Yeah, yeah, go for I, it. I got a shitty shirt on. I'm good with this. Hey, let me do this. There you go. Get us some air in here for a second. It's all good. There's that better? Yeah. So hopefully that's better, man. We had to let the air out in here. It's a little bit too hot. It got warm today, man. It's been so cold. I've had to keep that thing cranked up, you know? And every time I come get tattooed by you, you know me, I'm like, I need a sweatshirt, dude. Yeah, right? Yeah, you're freezing cold in there, and I hear you're sweating. Yeah. Yeah, you can't. You I'm can't. probably because I'm talking about things that not aren't uncomfortable, but are, are serious and enough to generate a little intensity. Uh. Well, yeah, you said you're an emotional feeling type person anyways, and I mean, yeah. you're sharing your life, bro. That shit's not easy for people. Yeah, um, it's funny too. Like the buzzword on the internet for a long time now has been empath, right? Uh, and um, it's just a word, and it just means you're sensitive to other people and their energy and their and their body language and the oh, way empathy. they talk. And I'm very much that, and I have been my whole life. I'm a super compassionate guy. At the end of the day, I want everybody to be happy. And See, it goes back to how I was raised and right. kind of this bubble of beauty. And that, I think that's one of the things that made me look at you in a different way too, is because I never was that person. I didn't even know what empathy was. Like, I, I didn't know uh, what humility was or empathy was until I went to treatment. Literally had no understanding, no definition in my head, didn't even know the words. Right. But they're very heavy words that play in being in sobriety, being clean, being, you know, understanding that somebody else can have an opinion that can help you regardless if you like them or not. Right. You know, regardless of how they say it. And, um, and it's funny, man, because as somebody who didn't grow up around a lot of people who struggled, um, I'm, even though I'm a caring, kind, kind of dude, I, I still was judgmental to some degree. You know what I mean? I, I <sighs> something I've been working on to this day, bro, because I, I'm still that way. And I think that's why I like doing these things like this is because I learn from guys like you and other people because we, uh, we can associate stuff back and forth. Right. We talk about a lot of stuff off of this, obviously. Um, but there's certain things that you both go through. And sometimes somebody can say they went through it and you're like, no shit. You know, I totally understand how that feels. Yeah. And, and, and it makes you feel not alone in whatever that is. And, uh, and, and I think that it's all, I mean, I, I, I think letting go of some of that judgment and, and realizing that what I would consider somebody who's a piece of shit with lack of control, you know, a lot of that disappeared. And and I, and so I think my my heart did open up to a lot of other folks that I probably didn't look at and take serious or um you know for lack of a better word like I said like thinking somebody's just kind of shitty and um, and I and I'm I'm glad that I had that experience and reacted to it the way I did uh, because I'm way more open minded about folks who are struggling right um, and you know I'm and I'm passionate about trying to help people, uh, trying to, you know, especially if people have, have issues with drinking, like, you know, I'm the first person to, to come up and, 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 and talk to them about it or be open and say, Hey man, like I drank like this for I 15 years. Patrick. I mean, you just took this kid, Patrick over the last year. Is he still clean? I think he's had some ups and downs, but he, you know, I helped him for a, a good long time. Right, and, and just uh, to summarize, so basically you met Matt on some place where we was filming one day. He talked about drinking. He asked for some help. You spent lots of money and lots of time helping him get into a clinic and getting his shit straightened out. Taking him to doctors every day, and uh, I would do it again. I mean, I would do it again. Um, I don't it think in, I'd spend... In the end, it cost you money. In the end, it cost you trust and things like that, but you still did it. And uh, you, like you said, you still do it again. I would do it again in a different capacity. Um, where I maybe didn't spread myself so thin. Mm -hmm. Again, that's a learning experience too of learning how to help folks. Um, so yeah, that's important to me. I wouldn't have felt that way if I wouldn't have 
gone and seen the things that I that I did in the the thirty day stint that I did in rehab. Uh, I know for a fact I would have probably. And I think a thing that's interesting, just what triggered my brain just now, is I did not like Pat. Yeah, I did not like him. I thought he was a lot of things, and I would have never done what you did for him. And I respect that, and I admire that because that takes a lot of character to step outside of yourself. You're an arrogant person, just like me. I know we are. We both are. You know it as well as I do. And you stepped out of your side of yourself and like, I don't know, I guess it's still a part of you. The empathy there was there for you to help that dude. What made you not judging? You think it was because of realizing everything, like you said, in rehab and. Yeah. I, there, I don't think my, I would have had, his, uh, had an open en- enough mind to have wanted to ex- extend myself the way I did. If I, if I didn't have those experiences of, of meeting people who at the end of the day are, are fantastic, but they just struggled and they had a different life than me. A lot of people grew up under some tough circumstances. And I, again, I, I just didn't give enough credit to how difficult that can be um, growing up in different environments. And I saw a kid who uh, came up to me and said, Hey man, I, I have, I have trouble drinking. And I, I didn't know how bad it, his problem was or what his situation was, but you know, he was essentially kind of homeless. He was, And I, uh, you know, he lived in a place that didn't have electricity. I remember, Looking at him one day and, and knowing that he didn't have a chance to shower as much as, as most people and stuff like that. And, you know, getting him into the gym, so taking him to the gym so he could get cleaned up and, and helped him get his laundry done. Because at the plus, he's fucked up, too. So he needed help. He he just couldn't. He wasn't in a place where he knew how he to. He would probably still be in that hole if you wouldn't have pulled him out of it, buddy. And, uh, That's something for you to be proud of. You should be proud of that. And yeah. regardless of what he does from here to the future, you did a good thing there. Yeah, and we still keep in contact, and I still uh, want the best for him. Um, but again, in hindsight, I would have done things a little bit different because maybe there was a little bit of enablement there because mm-hmm. uh, I was super patient. And I, I, but I did tell him, and I had to keep my word. I said, I don't care if you quit. Like I don't, I don't care what the result is. But if you if you want to make an effort and attempt, I'll I got your back, and I'll try and facilitate that as best I can. Yeah, and sometimes people go to rehab two or three times before they learn. I mean, I had to get burnt more than once. Yeah, at, no, at I can, many things before I learned my lesson. I consider myself super blessed, and again, I'm three years no drinking at this point, and um, it's it's funny. It's not a and it never. It wasn't a struggle for me when I when I left that place. I knew that in all likelihood, drinking wasn't going to be something I did for the rest of my life. Now, three years removed from it, I'm also realistic. And I, and I, I know that there's that temptation is going to be there. So the temptation is still there, but you don't pick up and just have that one beer either, because you said the one beer at the beach. I'll be right back. But you know that. Now. I'll be right back, dude, to 12 beers a day if I have one beer. It's important to know that, though. You have to know that about yourself, right? Same for me. I take a Xanax. I'm crashing my car. I'm going to jail. Right. It's that simple. Yeah. No. And I lost. And I said I lost my. I lost my wife. I lost my house. Hmm. I could barely keep a job. All and, the consequences that didn't come in your twenties. Yeah, twenties and thirties, and it's like uh, I knew that I lost enough to where I could not go through that shit again. Um, but the hard reality is, is life is tough, and so you know I can't sit here and tell you at sixty years old where I'll be or what I'll be thinking, God willing, I'll be alive. But uh, so, well, take me to a couple of things that you do daily. What do you, is there things you do daily to keep you straight? Is there people you talk to? Is there actions you take? Is there things you avoid? Um, it's weird. I, I think, I think for me being somebody again, who going back to the music thing that I always knew if there was a crossroad with music, the choice between being a rock star and being, having a family, that I wanted that family. That was always something that was ingrained in me. So losing that opportunity, because again, I'm 40 years old now and I decide to quit drinking. The reality of me meeting someone who is my age, who can still wants to have children, still can have children, quite frankly, was diminished. You know, now is it's still a possibility, sure. People say, you're, you're still young, you can have a family and children. And look, maybe that's the case, but I doubt it. I doubt it. I don't want to be a downer on that, but I probably lost those opportunities. There's a good, there's a good percentage that that's just the reality. Um, 
So I, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah. And, and look, I, maybe, I would challenge that and say you could you can go out and do more. You're very picky, Matt. Uh, yeah, very picky. There's that. So you have to find someone that's going to meet the standards that you want them to meet in order for you to move forward with that part of your life, if that's what you want to do. And uh, you got you hit it right on the head. And like, you know you can do that if you want to. You're not ready for that yet. No, I'm not. I mean, I, I I'm st- I'm not over my wife. Right. I'm that's just why, I'm that's just why not. You're not ready for it yet. Right. And, uh, you know, I'll concede to the fact that maybe not being a traditional father, like not having children of my own, uh, that's okay. I, I, I would happily be a step Bro, you would be the greatest dad, dad ever. I appreciate You'd that. You'd be the greatest dad ever. I already know you would. You would devote all your time and do everything you could towards that. You would, you would make that kid your purpose, especially if it was yours. And even if it was someone else's, you would do it just as much. Yeah, and I came to that reality to where I don't have to ha- be a tr- have a traditional family any longer if that's just not what's in the cards for me. Um, but that was hard to admit, I think, at first, knowing that. Well, I'm sure you could find some little mama to take care of. Got four or five little rug rats running around. Well, that might be a bit Come much. Come on, but... I probably know a couple. <laughs> but yeah, man, you could definitely find something to do there if that's what you wanted to do, man. But I think it is going to be hard to find a 35 or 40-year-old woman that doesn't already have children. Yeah, no, Now, that exactly. doesn't mean she can't have a kid or two or whatever, and you all still have another. Yeah, right. I get it. And again, so, th- and this goes back to me st- being still kind of somewhat stubborn and maybe too picky or, or what have you. Um, but at the end of the day, I am realistic about it. And, uh, but first I got, first and foremost, my, for whatever reason, I just haven't been able to, my heart just hadn't healed from what I, what I lost, man. I mean, this woman still means everything in the world to me and I drop everything in, on a dime. If but I drink could. is not an option to make that pain go away, though, right? No, no, and I you know that now you have to deal with it and deal with it on a different level than sure. And in your point, I mean, uh, I see a therapist. Okay, I I have a psychiatrist that helps me with. How often do you do that? Uh, once a week, man. Okay, is that like a phone call or a visit in so, person? Tell telemedicine now that the world okay. is the way it is. Um, uh, but I still think you know people say, oh, you need to go in person, but I still think. I can look at somebody in the eyes and we can have a good conversation over the, over the computer. That's fine. Um, but it helps, man. It helps. Um, you know, uh, I almost feel like I should do more sometimes. And, and I, I, I go to meetings once in a, once in a while, I, out of rehab, I was going to meetings more often. Um, so look, that, that part of you that has always been there, that I, I can do it on my own. There still is a little bit of that inside me. Right. Or I would be doing more things on a regimented schedule. And I think that a lot of people who are, who have addiction tendencies, they function better with a schedule, but I'm a pain in the ass. And, uh, I don't, you know, I'm a bit like, I'm an artist to some degree too. So like, I, I like a little bit of free flow and chaos, but I know I would pro I know when I'm, when I get into a routine, I mean, you're going to typically, you're going to function much higher as a as sure. a person, it's just not. That's just not my stick. That's just not h- how I am. Right, but I don't think it has to have a routine for your your, you know, your sobriety, if you will. You know, you know that you can't drink. You're talking to people about your feelings and emotions and right. shit that's going on in your life, which is the things that makes us use. Right. You know, it's feelings. It's it's dealing with something. It's uh, your wife or your job or. Whatever that makes us go use, like that's the numbness that we seek, right? Sure. And you know you can't do that. Yeah, no. I, I think that's important, though. That's important to, to state too, regardless of I'm going to meetings and I'm talking to a therapist. You know where your line is. You it's have a to choice. Draw that line, the and it's an active. Is exactly it, right. Yeah, man, it's an active choice every day to know that when you go to the grocery store, that and it's funny too. Like a lot of times I hear about people who are early in sobriety. You know, not wanting to walk past the beer aisle mm-hmm, or mm-hmm, wine mm-hmm. aisle in the grocery store, but I remember me just being the pain in the ass that I am, as I always wanted to tempt myself to, to be disgusted by that aisle. And to this day, you know, the grocery store here in town, the the soda, I drink way too much soda because my sh- sugar is one of the be- there's because there's sugar and alcohol. But I so after drinking, I became a huge love sweets and I still do it. It's been three years and I ice cream every night almost, but that's kind of neither here nor, here nor there. But, um, the soda aisles right by all the alcohol and, uh, I'll still look at it and say, fuck that. Like, fuck that. I think the disgust is a good thing though. Yeah. And, and, and 
I could have never quit some of the things I did till I got disgusted with the consequences of doing it. It's right. just that simple. The consequences wasn't worth the buzz. Right. And and I, at the same time, I still know that a few beers would probably feel good. You know? I, I know yeah. it would. I know I'd, I'd know Xanax that. Xanax would feel great. Feel awesome. I would love to have a Xanax. Right. It's just you, not in the. But it's, it's, it's not an option. It's not an option, man. It's not even a fucking choice. Right. Um, so, yeah, man, I think uh, between just knowing what I'd lost and what I'd always wanted um, and, and losing those things that I'd always wanted, and then just the, some of the supplemental help, like going to some meetings and, and, and doing the therapy and, and making sure that my brain was taken care of. You know, we can talk about uh, the, the chemicals in our brains, right? Some people are just predispositioned to have issues. You know, some people's brains just function at a much more regulated level. And I just wasn't lucky enough to have that, right? And I don't know if I damaged myself because of my drinking over 15, 20 years. I don't know. I don't know the scientific ramifications of that stuff, mm -hmm. but I have to imagine it played a role and it, and it will play a role in my anxiety and depression as an, as you know, through for the rest of my life. I don't know, but I, I'd be naive to think that, uh, I didn't damage some of those things. And right. again, the only way to, to fix it is to, to, to know that you need to take the next steps. And for me, again, it was getting the right, medications and, and my body to regulate my brain to a place where I didn't need to seek alcohol, right. To, to feel, to feel good. And I still struggle. I struggle, dude. Like I don't feel great. Like for the last few months, I haven't felt fantastic. Um, but as somebody who's bipolar, there are months where I'm manic and everything's fucking awesome. And I feel like, uh, the world is my oyster. And you know, then there are times where I just, Wanna right? Well, you're starting a new journey too, though, right? Didn't you say you got new jobs tomorrow? Yeah, man, I start a new job tomorrow, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's that's another gonna get you out of this. Routine. It's gonna get me out of my funk. Yeah, and, and routine I'm, of funkness. And I'm doing something that is going to uh, challenge me um, in ways that I didn't. Because this is my problem too. Is the, it, right the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over. And for me, with work, I would keep doing these high pressure sales gigs because it was on my resume and I, I knew I could get these jobs and I fucking hated them. And, and, and it did, it did stress me out. So like I was dealing with the stress, but maybe not perfectly. Okay. So what's this job? So I'll be uh, working for a graphic and sign company, man. I'll be getting my hands dirty. I'll be building some things. I'll be doing some graphic design, which I have some experience in doing that from mm -hmm. when I went to school and, uh, I've, I've always taken the art of all kinds. So I've done logos and I've done, but I guess the point is, is I'll get my hands in a little bit of everything and my day. And I won't just be sitting at a computer all day trying to sell something to somebody who doesn't want to talk to me. Right. And, uh, I hate those calls and don't call me, get a real yeah, job. Dude, I worked. That's how I feel when my phone rings and they're trying to sell me something like, why don't you go get a real fucking job? And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. Like my first job out of rehab was a sales gig and I don't, I, I don't know why I don't want to say the name, but I worked for Yelp and dude, it's just all day long calling, just nonstop calling people who business owners who don't want to talk to you, who have a bad opinion of this company for the most part, to be quite frank, like there, I didn't get a lot of people that like, yay, Yelp, you've helped me in the past. No, mm. it was, I don't want to spend my money on this bullshit. And, uh, but what I'll say is that it helped me in a lot of ways learn that after drinking I could still be successful at something if it made me anxious because I I was there for a year and a half and I and I did a pretty damn good job get um, comfortable being uncomfortable that's there you said it you nailed it on the head dude is accepting the fact that in life to be successful and to grow you have to embrace that yeah. and even though I still don't like it it was nice to know that as long as I didn't have alcohol in my life I could be successful, even doing something that was challenging and that I didn't particularly care for. So that was good. That was a great lesson for me. Um, Interesting thing I learned recently through Andrew Huberman and uh, oh, David yeah. Goggins. You know who David Goggins is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Andrew Huberman said that there was a new data point where they could measure your willpower. Part of your brain produces willpower. We can measure it. 
The only way to increase your willpower was by doing things you hate. Yeah, I can see that. And he says, once you stop hating it, that part of your brain stops growing. That's interesting. I thought that was so crazy. And then David Goggins is who he was talking to this about. And then this man has run till his knees fell apart. And then he ran another hundred miles. Right, right. You know what I mean? It's amazing the stuff he has been able to do through his discipline and willpower and hating it. He didn't like none of that shit, but his willpower is so strong because he's always doing things he hates. I don't yeah. like doing things I, I hate, bro. I look, I don't have that much uh, my gum, willpower's gumption, on bro. Like, yeah, my willpower is on like a 5% because <laughs> I don't do a whole lot of shit I hate, man. Yeah, no, and yeah, me neither. And and I and I hope as I continue through through this path and in, in life that uh, I can embrace more of those challenges with e- more easily because I still struggle with those things, but it's still night and day compared to what it was. Yeah, it really you is. You got to be thankful for that. Oh yeah, no matter what, man. Like you know, everything else aside, wife, relationship, jobs, at least you're not fucked up. Yeah, life is. You know what I mean. At least there is a foundation uh, to build your house. Right. You know what I'm saying? There's no foundation when it's uh, all liquid. No, absolutely not, man. It's not going to hold anything. And I think, too, for the longest time, and I maybe I still struggle with it a touch, is knowing that it took me this long in life, half you know, the halfway point for all extents and purposes, is, uh, uh, intents and purposes, rather, is, uh, yeah, I struggle with that. I'm older. Yeah, so but now I'm you're older. talking about regret. Yeah. Yeah, so I still I still hang on to some of that. Fuck yeah, who doesn't? Come on, man. One of the I don't biggest... realize it though. It's funny in this conversation, I'm I'm realizing that I probably have, I probably have a struggle with regret more than I, more than I give it, it, it credit. Yeah, well, regret is what it's lost opportunity. Yeah, it's a lost opportunity for you to be ten times further along than what you are, or for you to be with your wife or anything else that your hope tells you. Right. I mean, because that's still hope looking backwards. I don't care if you're looking backwards. You're still hoping that this would have happened a different way. Sure. Yeah, man. Uh, But life is about learning new things, man. It's about moving and changing and not growing stagnant, right? Yeah. and We we get comfortable with the same old dumb shit. And then next thing you know, we're 40 years working for somebody else, making them millions. And then we retire to nothing. Right. and Because we're scared of change. Yeah, that's that scares me. You know, is, is, and, you know, I don't know where my trajectory is right now. Cause I'm still figuring it out. I'm still mm-hmm. putting my shit back together. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, sometimes I forget that sometimes, a lot of times I still think that I need to be miles and miles ahead of where I'm at. But again, I, there has to be a, so sometimes controlling that thought's going to control your anxiety. Yeah. I'm learning that because you're so anxious because you feel like this should be happening. This right. is supposed to have happened by now, and then you're anxious because it hasn't. Yeah, and there and look, different people react differently to that stress. I'm st- I still I'm a creature of habit. I still fall into these moments where I well I self where I isolate myself where I I don't have any real motivation. Mm-hmm. You know, knowing that there are things that are going to make me happier on a daily basis, and I neglect those from time to time. I still I'm still struggling with that. Once in a while. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that this is probably the 10th one of these I've done. And not one person has sat there and said they don't struggle. Yeah. Not one. You can't say that. Care if you've been sober your whole fucking life, you struggle in life. Right. You know, and I think accepting that and understanding that everybody struggles through shit makes you the same as everybody else in that format. Yeah. And I'm sure that. Anybody who listens to this or, or what have you might say, geez, this, this guy's still, you know, he, he's delusional in, in the fact that he, 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 I like, I don't, I don't think I do give credit enough for that. Life is tough. Life is tough, man. Um, and you could have everything in the whole fucking wide world that you've ever wanted, but we, you could get in an accident. You could, you know what I mean? You could get in a car accident. You could lose parts of your family you could you could you could injure yourself to where you 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 won't be able to do any of the things in life you used to um you know and you see so many stories where people prevail over that stuff um because they're strong and i think i think for me at this point i just hope that i can continue to gain strength from seeing people who are stronger than me you know what i mean um because i know that i'm such a work in progress when it comes to being maybe a little tougher Maybe 
understanding that it's it is a little it, yeah but I don't know. you're willing to grow yeah dude i'm you're willing. saying you're willing to learn you're willing to grow that's all that matters like you know we can't grow stagnant and just stay doing the same thing yeah right and i think that grow older grow wiser pass down your wisdom and know that and i think uh and i think patience comes into God. it as well dude is does it ever is in and you know that's not an easy thing for most people but uh you know, certainly not for myself so no no i get into such a hurry sometimes i got five thoughts in my head and i can't do them all at one time I just yeah. can't i can't do and it you get the, frustrated bro and i've learned I'll, I'll say to myself i'm like calm down slow down and focus and i shut my eyes sometimes and fucking say that shit out loud right because in that moment if i don't like i can't even keep my thoughts straight you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I want to go do this. And I'm trying to do five things at once and all of them are half done or I'm dropping something on the floor. I'm yep. breaking something. Oh, yeah. I'm not getting it accomplished. But when I slow down and I, I chill out, I focus on what I'm doing and I say, I'm going to do one, two, three, four, and I do it. And do them in order without thinking about the other ones, I get it done. No, and that's the key, man. And that, that's an awesome skill to have starting to master, right? Is to be able to, number one, to recognize how you're behaving, what's going on in your mind, and then how does that translate physically in what you're getting done? So the the uh, the acknowledgement and the understanding is such a big piece, and then the follow through, right? It is knowing where do I where does number one start and where's number five end or, or what, whatever the case may be, but knowing an order that makes sense, right? I th- and I think that's what this whole series is about. That's what this whole series that I'm going to release is about. It's about how you think and. If you think something that somebody else can take and and that can help them understand it differently because you describe it differently, then that's what this is all about. Right. Like, I I know when I was struggling and I didn't have anything to refer to, you know what I mean? Pre-internet, pre all this stuff that we have now, the information right at our fingertips. Right. So maybe if I would have had some of that information, maybe I would have known better. Because well, I didn't know nothing about addiction, no more than you. I knew my my parents were, or not my parents, but my grandparents were alcoholics. My dad smoked a little pot. Right. That was all I knew. I didn't know nothing about anything else until I was in it. Mm-hmm. And it was too late. Nobody said don't do pills. Nobody said that, the, you know, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. I really didn't know those things. I guess you kind of grow up, drugs are bad, blah, blah, blah. Sure. But without a, a context... You know what I'm saying? Without the context of how bad that drug is, what it does to people, you really don't understand what it's going to do to you, do you? No. And look, everybody's different too, man. There are some people's, yeah, I mean, they're, I don't know. There are some people that can dabble and have some fun and, 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 and and that's it. And that's about it. And turn it right off. Do, do pain pills for two days, turn it off for three years. Drink for once or twice a week and never have a problem. Right. And some of us, our brains aren't made that way. Right. And it's funny. I think I used to envy folks who had the ability to quote unquote be normal and mm-hmm. to be able to enjoy some of the ad- indulgences of life. Um, but at the end of the day, th- th- this is just. You can't compare it. No, exa- that's that's you my can't point. And, 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 and I. I've always been a, somebody who wants to compare. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's like, again, it's apple and oranges. breaking out of these old habits. Um, it's fucking hard. And, uh, you know, especially when you're trying to do it halfway through your life. Yes. Once you've already become accustomed to living a certain way for right. 20, 25 years. And now someone says, hold on. Now you got to put your pants on right leg first. Sure. And you're like, have you ever tried to put your clothes on opposite of what you normally do? That's funny. It's no. a habit because I always put my left leg in first. I try to put my right leg in and it feels like the craziest thing ever. It's so weird. That's too funny. But that's life. Yeah. Your life becomes a habit. Sure. And then when you try to put your right leg in instead of your left leg, it feels fucking weird and we don't like it. Right. We don't right. like change. We don't like that discomfort. And we get stuck putting our left leg in every day. It doesn't matter if that goes into a fucking alligator's mouth. Sure. I heard, I heard something, and it's along those lines: is uh, start brushing your teeth with your opposite hand, and uh, it it does it does it fires something up in here. Something crazy, you're right. Just little little things. Because it's just so easy to do it the certain way. Yeah, Same man. thing. Like I get, try to write or draw or hammer or put a drill or whatever else with your other hand. That's like, whoa, what the fuck? It's really weird. Yeah, I know, and it's little things, and and that's another thing I learned too, or I am learning, is. 
is, is momentum in that celebrate your little victories that are taking you to a bigger place. Right. Right. Like, um, and that's, that's huge for me. And I, I think momentum is a gift that should not be wasted and it's not going to always be there. Mm -hmm. But when you feel it, run with that, you know, extract every bit of positivity that you can when you know that you're, you're, right. you're cooking. And when one positive thing happens, put 10 times as much energy into that than you do that one negative thing. Right. That one negative thing happens. If you give that son of a bitch energy, if you keep on talking about how horrible it was, all you're doing is making it stronger. You have to ignore that negativity in your life. You can't run around bitching and cussing. Get a solution to the problem. Move the fuck on. Yeah. And find the joy in life. Yeah. No. And, it, and look, it can be challenging for people. And I think that... um. For me, uh, blowing things out of proportion or making them more grant, giving something more credit than it deserves, especially negativity, is a hard skill that I've tried to learn is to say, when something st really stresses me out or I feel that anxiety, just take a second. Like, you can feel that. You can acknowledge that you're, this is fucking bothering you. But think about how realistic what you're really thinking is. Based upon something else that you can do that makes a lot more sense. And, and how is it beneficial for you to think about the negative, right? Well, yeah, certainly it's not, but it's going to happen for sure because we're human beings. So here's an example. I went through Chick-fil-A this morning. I had to go to Lowe's real quick. I went through Chick-fil-A, $10.35. So I give her a 20 and 35 cents. When I put it out the window, I put the 35 cents on the piece of metal, and then I put the 20 on there, and I kind of hold it down so it don't blow away. She picks up the change. She gets the 20. She gives me my 10 back and she says, here, let me put this in your hand. I was like, oh, thank you. Like being a smart ass because I didn't put it in her hand. Right. And bro, this just got me. <laughs> this just got me. Like right there in the moment, I almost cussed her. I almost was like, fuck you, bitch. But instead I was like, thank you very much. Right. Have a great day. Yeah. And I pulled away. Yeah, you reprogrammed yourself to Right, not react. but around that corner and up around the corner till I got to right there where I'm looking at the homeless man that's been begging for money right there for the last two months. Yep. I'm still thinking about it. And I'm like, why do I give two fucks about that? Right. That one little interaction, I am not going to allow that to control any more of my day past this red light right here. And then- here it is controlling my day. Yeah, again. no, it's fun. that would have that would have bothered me to no end as well, and I wouldn't have been able to let that go either. For like, time would have to have passed. It, it, it's because it, I'm perplexed by people going out of. It takes so much more energy to be shitty, right, than it does to be nice. And, and I tried to think about it in her perspective. I was like, okay, you're sitting there getting all that money, all that, and it would be easier if it's in your hand. But was it really that hard for you to pick up that dime in that quarter? Was it really right. that difficult that you had to make that comment? Like, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know that you don't like it being put down right there. Right. I don't know that you don't have fingernails or whatever the fuck your problem is. But I tried to get past all that and I tried to understand where she's coming from. Maybe it was more difficult. She didn't like that. And I, I analyze the whole situation yeah. now instead of just acting out of anger and cussing somebody out and spinning the tires out of the guy drive through because that's what I used to have done. And right, and and it's it look man, it's a learn it's learned a behavior to say that person she was being lame in that instance, but that's her problem. You know what I'm saying? And leave and, leave, and just leaving it there. Mm -hmm. That's hard. That's hard to. You know, and it's not like it it's gonna ruins your day, but it's it, to 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 not react, to have a no reaction to that. That takes some willpower. It was hard to to say, you know, have a good day, right? Oh, right. thank you, have a good day. Just like I was just trying to be as nice, as, and then I think I did murmur under my breath, "You rude bitch," <laughs> right. or something like that as I pulled away. But again, I just wasn't going to let it affect me. I'm not giving any more power or or energy to the negativity, man. I'm just not going to do it. If I'm around you and you're being negative, I'm not even going to uh, acknowledge your negativity. Yeah. I'm not even going to acknowledge it, bro. I I'm appreciate over that. it. I'm over it. I'm tired of living that way. Yeah, no, I hope I get to that point. I'm not quite there yet. And I'm not perfect at it either. Yeah. I'm speaking this shit into existence right, right, is right. what I'm doing. Yeah, and that's what it takes. It takes effort. Mm-hmm. It takes effort, you know? You 
Yeah, and that's what this is all about, man. It's about growing. It's about getting bigger, getting stronger, at staying straight, at staying uh, productive. That's what I want. I want. I'm rooting for everybody, man. Sure. I'm rooting for everybody to do better. I don't want nobody to be in the gutter. I don't want nobody to feel bad. I don't, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, and look, you're a good friend, man. Like, you, 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 you'll you, call me out of the blue sometimes and you don't hear from me for a while and you'll, and you'll make sure, you know I have, you know, you've known me well enough now to know that, you know, if I, ain't, if I haven't seen Matt, uh, that's so funny. I don't know why I said Matt, but I never call myself Matt. <laughs> but uh, I guess because that's what most people call me. But, um, you know, you took the time to go out of the way to check on me, man. Just a quick conversation to say, hey, dude, how, how are you doing? And if you're not doing great, like try, you know, get out of your uh, switch up your routine or, mm-hmm. or what, what? It doesn't matter, but and whatever, I appreciate whatever, that. Yeah, in you. right. And I, 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 I appreciate you noticing that. Um, because that is something I'm changing as well. That's a good I've friend. Always, I've always been a selfish person, but I've always been a good friend. And I've always been a loyal fucking friend. Sure. If you're loyal to me and you treat me right, I'm going to fucking treat you right. Because I don't shit on people that shit on that don't shit on me. It's just how it is. Right. And even people that shit on me, I just most of the time I blow them off and let it go. I don't even care, bro. Just get on. I got no time for that negativity in my life. But yeah, I appreciate you saying that. And that's something I've been working on too. There's a small little family of us that you know of. You know what I mean? Scotty and, yeah. and, you know, all of us that I mess with, you know, all my bros and all that kind of stuff. And and a lot of times they don't meet expectations of mine because I expect them to do what I would do. Mm-hmm. And I'm learning to change that, too. Yeah. Well, and let them be who they are. Call me when you can. Talk to me when you want to. I'm not going to be mad at you for not contacting me. You know what I mean? People got lives, man. You know what I'm saying? And I think we have to care about that. And if I call, most of the time I don't get an answer from 90% of them boys, but they always call me back. Right. They always call me back. Just to check on me, just to check on them, how you doing, how things doing. I think that's important, man. And as men, we don't do that enough. No, certainly not. And I think, look, a lot of times you might think something in your head where you might think about your friend, how are they, I wonder how they're doing. But to take the extra time to reach out, especially as men, right? It often goes overlooked or it just go, it, we, we sweep that away. So, you know, it, it's, it's great when people have a good heart, when they care about folks, but it it takes another type of a person to to take it to the next step right. and to really care and to right, really to check in, right? Action. Especially when you just call to say, yo, what's up with you, bro? How you doing? Yeah. I'm not asking you for nothing. I don't need nothing from you. Yeah. just want to know what's up with you. Yeah. That shit means something. You get off the phone sometimes, you're like, damn, that was cool. Mm-hmm. No, 100%, dude. And I, uh, I, uh, I appreciate people who uh, do those things because a lot of people just don't. Um, cause people do have lives and, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and I get, and, you know, I, I feel very, what you had just said about that. I feel, uh, I feel the same exact way. Like getting older, you realize that, you know, people have their shit, but when somebody take, goes the extra mile to do something for somebody else, whether it's small as just picking up the telephone, th- that shit matters. And it means more now than it probably ever did in my life. Right. Yeah, man. That's what's up. Um, well, yeah, dude, I'm glad you came. Like you want to drop any links or anything? You want anybody to know a Facebook page or any of that type of stuff? I mean, your name's going to be in the title, so. Yeah, nah, dude, I don't care. Like, okay. uh, um, cause I, and I always say that because, uh, I still get a few messages now and again from other podcasts that I've done. Yeah. And somebody would just hit me up and be like, Hey, I seen your story. Uh, I liked what you had to say. I'm following you, you know, just stay, stay whatever. Yeah, man. And I, it's cool to get those messages from people in, uh, the UK, or right. Brazil. I got an appointment. I got one from this guy in Brazil yeah, one that's time. Awesome. Like, and it's just, you know, so if they want to hit you up, man, I'll leave a link or that's cool. it's I, Matt Green on Facebook. Matthew Green, right? Is it? See, I don't know. I, I'm, I, was, I think it's Matthew Green I'm on Facebook. I'm the worst at self-promotion. Right. Um, you know, and it's funny, man, like talking about uh, having moments where I'm a little more upbeat, it, it, whatever, being moody. Uh, for lack of a better term, like there are times where I'll post a lot of stuff on, on especially music stuff mm-hmm, if I'm working mm-hmm. on. And there are times where I go months without it. So right. right now I'm kind of in a period where I, I don't know, but I can tell you that uh, I'll be working on some new music soon, probably sooner than later. So, right on. Um, but yeah, man, I appreciate you and having me. at the same me. time too, if somebody did reach out to you, that means something to you the same and way as somebody else calling. Yeah. And, and you I'm, will respond. I know you'd respond. hundred percent. Um, because again, it takes effort to reach yes. out and say, "Hey, man, like what you're doing." Or found that's it. why it means so much. Yeah. When they hit me up from nowhere, exactly because they don't have to do none of that shit. Yeah. So the least I can do is is say, "Hey, thanks," and and interact, right? Right. right? So no, I, and I uh, 
Be wasn't... human. Be human, right? Just be human. Just dude. be more human. And man. put your That's best all foot we can forward, do, bro. <laughs> Stop being such a technological nerd with our face stuck in these stupid machines all the time where we have no interaction with people on a level like this. It's this text, and then you don't even understand what the text means because they say ion and stupid ass things that aren't even words. Right. And I just feel like we're getting so far away from this. Yeah. It's, and I, so, and I appreciate you. Uh, this actually was more cathartic, and uh, I enjoyed this more than I anticipated because coming in here, I wasn't sure what, uh, you know, I'm, I don't, I didn't, get arrested a hundred times and, and go to and have, I don't have right. any really insane stories. So I'm like, how entertaining. And, and at the end of the day, it's not about that. It's about no. having an interaction. And uh, I appreciate it, dude. And uh, thank you. It's about both of us growing. And if somebody can watch this and they learn something from either one of us, man, that's what it's about. And uh, I'll go back home tonight and I'll have, I'll, I'll, just from hanging out with you this afternoon, I'll feel a little bit better about my evening. That's what's up. That's, you know what I'm saying? So thanks, dude. Well, yeah, as soon as we get done this, we're getting ready to burn one and uh, yeah, chill man. for a minute if you want. Let's get it. Let's do it. So <laughs> that's what's up, man. This is Matt, man. He kept it real, bro. Like, I know this guy. I know everything that he said is true because we've been talking about it for the last two years. So, you know, uh, drop a like, leave a comment, message him, um, and let him know how you feel, man. That shit means a lot, whether you believe it does or not. And, you know, if you're still watching to this point into this video, then obviously you were entertained and you took some of what we said seriously. So we appreciate that for sure. Yeah, no, I certainly appreciate it. And, and absolutely, if somebody wants to ask a question or, or uh, if for the smallest thing made you want to reach out, uh, happy to expand, just be a part of that conversation. Right so, yeah, dude. Hell yeah. Likes are free. Don't forget. They're free.